from hard to find key decision makers to wonky sales cycles, selling products or services to hotels, it can be a painful process. I spoke with Jess Hayes from Hayes Fatality on why it's so difficult and how the process is different than it is say 10 years ago and what does she mean by the art and science of it all. If you're a hotel vendor or supplier, you're gonna to wanna to check this one out. All right, Jess. Hey, welcome to the NSYNC show. Super Thanks. excited to have you on. Is Justin Timberlake coming? <laughs> hey, maybe. I, I've invited <laughs> him. I'm getting ghosted by him. He's got other better, better things to do. Hey, until then, I've got great guests, primarily sales and marketing and hospitality. And I, we're going to talk a little bit about selling into hotels. And I've got Jess Hayes. She's from Hayes Fatality. And she is a hotel tech advisor. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Corey. Hey, I'm going to dive right in here. And yes. we've talked about it a little bit before. Some people don't realize how difficult it is to sell to hotels. Can you explain a little bit more why it's so difficult? Oh boy. Right now, the biggest challenge is labor shortage. So before now, it was always hard to find the stakeholder, to find the person who cared the most about the solution that you were selling. So. Even before the pandemic, it was like, do you call the GM? Do you call the director of sales? Do you call revenue, front office, the owners, the management companies, the brands? And then sometimes you have 15 people on one single call. That many people care about your solution, but sometimes it really is just one person. Finding that person, finding the thing that keeps them up at night, solving for it and being able to say, this hotel has solved for that same exact thing and rinse and repeat and telling that story, that's a process that takes a lot of time. And it always took a lot of time. I've always had to really coach tech companies on managing the realities of the sales cycle for hotels. Hmm. But now with the labor shortage, you have two things going on. You have you're, the bandwidth, everybody's bandwidth is less. You have the general manager, maybe he's the decision maker, but he's up there making the beds, right? So you can't really get to him. Mm. And then there's a lack of trust right now because there's been a lot of chaos over the last few years. The great part about that is that there's a lot of innovation, but that means, okay, are you a trusted vendor? I don't really have time for you unless you're a trusted vendor. But I think there's a lot going on, right? It's not just one thing, but that's what makes it fun is if you know that you're solving a problem and addressing challenges, then you just have to be a bulldog about finding the person who cares about your solution. Really good point. I would also wager to say somebody that's an outsider working in it, I was always mesmerized the relationship between ownership, management yeah. company, and then you got people at the property. Sometimes the people at the property are making those decisions anyways, right? It's actually the management company at, at times. Yeah, it's hard to navigate. And, and you think you have it solved for a particular ho hotel group, and then you talk to one that maybe has a similar profile, but the owners are dictating a lot <laughs> right. of it. The, and then you're like, oh, I thought the management company was more involved. And it really, it's not a uniform set of decision makers. And again, that's what makes it fun, but it also makes it extremely challenging. And I think, again, as long as you understand that this, you can have a very short sales cycle if you get directly to that person when they're having the problem with the solution. And that's amazing but mostly it's a set of blended skills and resources that that enable that conversation to happen. And it is complex. How different is it today than it was say 10 years ago? Great question. One thing is that we're back to in-person. So 10 years ago, there was a lot of budget for sending salespeople on the road to go hotel by hotel. You would build, I would build these trips in New York and I'd three hotels a day for three days in a row, like a road warrior. And that's how I went and sold my technology. We moved away from that over time. And then through the pandemic, we definitely moved away from that. We had to sell on Zoom. Now, people want to meet in person again. And I think that's because there's uh, the trust factor. And also we're just all ready to connect. And then with AI, that's going to change the game exponentially because there's way more. So one of the big differences, there's way more vendors even before AI mm. came on the market. Right. Open APIs opened up a whole bunch of new vendors. Now you have AI. So it's you're competing for people's time. Exactly. Whereas 10 years ago, there weren't as many. And now it's okay. You're getting inundated with all these new players. 
who do you trust? And are you going to implement 15 different solutions if you're talking to 15 different vendors for different things? Absolutely. It has made it so much more convoluted. And as you mentioned before, with the onset of more choices, there's yeah. more communication and there's more distractions and there's more, it requires so much more, many more touch points now, right? To break through. You said the attention span is the new, actually the new currency is, yeah. uh, and it is so hard with everybody's it, it is being pulled in so many different directions to get somebody's attention, not just at this moment, but consistently, I'm assuming that's another, would be another challenge as well. Yeah. So it's funny, but one of the things that builds trust is, is repeated touch points, yes. right? So if I say, I'm going to call you next week, if I write you an email and say, Hey, I have, I really think that you can benefit from this solution because X hotel has also benefited from it. And I'm going to give you a call next week so we can talk about it. And then I don't call. And then I send another email like three weeks later saying, Hey, that's, that doesn't build trust. Oh. So it, it may not be that they want to answer the cold calls, but being persistent, making, because if you believe in what you're selling, you want to get to that person and they can at any time say, you know what, not the right time, not the right solution. I'm not the right person, but you still have to keep, unless you hear that you have to keep on your various touch points. And that's where marketing is so important for a sales team the alignment between sales and marketing. Uh, that's another thing that I talk to a lot of tech companies about. Don't rely on your road warrior salesperson, like build in a lot of marketing. That is such a good point. In fact, my post today on LinkedIn was about the might well a comment was, hey, forget about marketing. It's just frill and fluff. As long as you have a sales team that can pound the phones. <laughs> years ago. That's right. You, it's so easy now to avoid a phone call. Yeah. And 10 years ago, I was an SDR. I was doing the phone calls. That's how I learned to sell. And it was great training ground, but it, first of all, I couldn't still have that kind of volume. You get burnt out. And yeah, that's exactly right. The people can dodge a phone call all day long. And, totally. and we need sales and marketing needs to have the same message, the same drive, the same support system, right? When I'm feeling low, because maybe I've gotten five people to hang up on me. That's when I want to turn to my marketing team and say, can we think of something new to say, or can we think of a different way to say it? Or maybe this isn't the right, maybe the buyer persona isn't right. When that's what lifts me up as a salesperson is having those conversations. And then I think for marketing, I'll let you speak how you like to collaborate with sales. Before we jumped on this call, you, I threw out the word inbound marketing and you yeah. lit up because yeah. that, you and I both come from that mentality. I've never been comfortable on forcing myself on somebody to buy a product or service they may not want or may not need. Right. Some people wear that as a badge of honor. I, mm -hmm. I think that is absolutely horrible. I, and it's a good way to blow trust. Like you just mentioned, I'd yeah. much rather, and it does, it's not ro rocket science. If you've got a product or service that solves a specific acute pain point, yeah. marketing can do such a great job of illuminating that agitating that problem, how that problem is impacting your bottom line, probably yeah. negatively, right? Yeah. Marketing is just going to illuminate that so that in turn, those people that are suffering from that problem are going to reach out to you because you can solve it for them. This isn't my magic dust or beans or well, having to pound the phones for crying out well, loud. And what you see a lot is salespeople blaming marketing and marketing people blaming sales. And that just gets people nowhere. It's the same on the hotel side where, you know, revenue people blame sales and sales people blame more, but no one gets anywhere. That's why hotel created commercial strategy so that <laughs> their internal teams could be aligned. And so we need to do that on the vendor side as well. Absolutely. In fact, up until a couple of months ago, I didn't even know what commercial strategy was. I didn't right. realize they were operating in silos. I'm like, what? Yeah. I come from the days where a director of sales then got an M put on the back of their title and they became director of sales and marketing. <laughs> All right, yeah. Right? Yep. And they were like, oh, okay, so now I'm a director of sales and marketing. And then revenue came and they were its own sort of department. So now it's, it's so cool to see the teams collaborating for the greater good. It just, it cuts down on the friction. Absolutely. And I think also appreciating each other, right? Not right. pointing fingers, but coming together in as one in, a, in alignment to move it's in that uh, a rising tide lifts all boats type of scenario because yeah. yes 
when executed correctly, marketing, sales, and revenue is, it's like, a, it, it's moving in harmony and, and as one. Yeah, I love that. And as it should be with every other industry as well. What do you mean specifically when you talk about the art and science? Oh, great. So we all know the science from a sales perspective, at least when the way I was trained, which is if you throw enough spaghetti against the wall, some of it's going to stick, right? Yeah. The numbers game, it's a volume game. If I'm supposed to close X amount of hotels over, then that means I need to reach 10 times as many or whatever the numbers are. So there's numbers in sales. And a lot of leaders count on numbers, in my opinion, a, like a little too much, but there's a whole art to it. And that's what you and I have been talking about where it's no, really, I need to find the person who cares. And I think the reason why I say art and science is because I start from a place of empathy. Like when I started my career in hospitality, I had to fly out every Sunday, come back every Friday and train a sales team in, in a hotel, how to use software that they didn't buy, right? Somebody else made the decision to buy the, the time it's Delphi still around. Um, and so I saw firsthand what it's like to implement a technology that it was change, right? There was a lot of change. There was a lot of, this was manual to automation. So it was mm. a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And so I think the art is the empathy. Understand what it is to do this person's job, first of all, then figure out is the automation going to help? And the art part of it is being creative in letting them know that, yes, it's probably going to take time and there's going to be some change management, but this is going to make your job better and therefore make your life better. Um, so I think the art of it, and that's what I get, like the creativity. I know you talked to our dear friend, Nick, the creativity around how you approach these conversations and how you get people invested in the solution. That's the fun. And then of course you do, you have to do your job. You have to, there has to be volume and that's the science part. So I could think that's why I say it's an art and science. That really stuck a chord with me because our actual tagline at Lure is science and soul marketing. So it's a little bit different. No, it's very similar. Yeah. It, it's that whole, and it's that perfect balance between using AI, I, data, but also the creativity. You need both parts. Yeah. And oftentimes, and you had mentioned it, it, the science is a numbers game, but oftentimes there are things that aren't tracked are you can't attribute to which is yeah, that whole concept of dark social yeah if i said jess when you come to san diego you need to go to paradise point and you end up booking a stay there or you booking your event there that's not tracked There's so many things right. that we do in marketing that are not tracked and this obsession with the attribution the spreadsheets the numbers is really a disservice and yeah. When I'm at my best selling wise, it's, I lean on marketing and I say, okay, I have a new goal to sell X amount of New York city hotels. Tell me the story of the happy customer in New York that I can keep telling. Yeah, and yeah, I need marketing yeah, for yeah, that. Yeah. Like I can verbally tell it, but there's a lot more to telling those stories Absolutely. Of, and giving the salespeople the tools and giving the marketing people this. What I love is when marketing calls me and says, tell me everything that you're hearing from Absolutely. your conversations and it's yeah but i love your point you cannot track everything like data's queen as i say there's a lot more nuance to it as well absolutely i also think the creativity is that point where if, as long as if you can make something interesting that's how you right. also break through yeah so a lot of us in the marketing space it's all about the clicks and it's about the reach and about mm -hmm. the, the this and this that but it's not about a memorable message that breaks through and makes someone say i love that that's amazing yeah. it yeah. takes creativity and it takes the soulness uh, to break through so that's why we like to use that delicate balance and it, it, you perfectly had mentioned the, the art and soul of, the, of that because i think it's it there's equal weight in both parts for sure I was talking to a new hotel management company, brand new. They're really shaking things up. It's really mm. fun. They're called Rooms. And today he goes, he was telling me about his mission and, and all the different things he's doing with the tech stack. And he was like, we don't have brand standards. We have high standards. Nice. Like, oh, that's magic. That's awesome. Love things that. like that where it's okay. That's Absolutely. what guests want. Guests want a hotel that, that has high standards for their guests that goes above and beyond. You know, I was an art director on the creative uh, side and it was always about, Hey, it's gotta be the right, the font palette and the, the color mm. the consistency. And there is something to that, but now 
I'm gravitating more towards what you just mentioned. Sometimes getting off brand, and that's, I think that's where a lot of hotels are stuck in this trap is like the whole yeah. concept of user generated content. It's not how we would say it at the hotel. Sometimes we got to break that, those stigmas down. And one of it is I'm getting off this whole thing of the brand standard because yeah. I don't necessarily think that's always applicable anymore. And somehow the overemphasis of brand standards has diluted the brand. Yes. <laughs> that's a great point. <laughs> Very good point. And I don't know how that's happened. That's more your, <laughs> ah. but it's, it's harder to differentiate, but it's also, I think coming from, if you, again, if you operate from a place of empathy, what do the guests want? What do they want? If you execute on that full 360, yep. the bottom line's going to grow. That's and right. That, I just got off my last conversation is someone in revenue has got to do a, an illustration of lifetime guest value. Yeah. Me, as a 25 year guest customer of Paradise Point, I've referred them hundreds of thousands of business. Yeah. They've got to be able to connect those dots and realize yeah. if, if they treat me like a VIP, they're going to get so much more money rather than just that one single click that I'm going to book this one time. Look at the entire picture. The hotel, we've been talking about getting a 360 view of, of the guest for the longest time. That's what PMS systems were supposed to have. And some do a better job of others, but just because you have the data, what do you do with the data? And that's where we're at right now. Totally. And that's why AI is so fun. Cause it's what the power of what the data is going to bring is it's going to blow everybody's minds. Absolutely. In fact, my, one of my last call, it's a, a chat element. And we had a really great mm -hmm. discussion about being able to at the right moment without being too creepy is dropping personal moments that really resonated. It could be a, a fun photo of your dog's footprints down the beach. And at, at the right moment, just a fun little casual engagement that knew that they cared about me. Yeah. That one little moment would have such an impact on my buying habits for that property forever. Yep. The psychology around that is fascinating. And as you'd mentioned, I'm really looking forward to seeing how AI can help leverage and really dig into that buying cycle and how to motivate and dig into the psychology and dig in to, yeah. to, to really leverage I, the psychology of us. Yeah. I want tech companies to know that every November in New Hampshire, I start to look for all my winter vacations because I can feel the light change yep. and I get online and I'm like, whether it's business travel or leisure or a combination, which is typically how I travel. It's, I want them to know that's when I start searching because it's going to save me time. Sure. If I'm served up with personalized recommendations, like I'm all about saving time. So it's going to be exciting to finally feel like you're being heard as a traveler. Absolutely. And as a guest. Venture, I say, Jess, it's time we put hospitality back into this whole process, right? Yeah. Yep. Totally. <laughs> What are some suggestions that you can give um, for those that are trying to sell to hotels right now? Mm. I think you and I touched upon it. I just, I really want people to understand <laughs> the sales cycle. It's very hard to predict. You're, and I think a lot of tech companies are looking for quick wins. Who do you, and, that, and as an advisor and consultant, I get approached all the time saying, can you introduce me? If I introduced all my contacts to all my different tech companies. No one would listen to anything I said. So I think that point is the sales cycle. Very important to know. And it's not linear, by the way, right? That's right. No. Mm -mm. We always Again. think it's a, it's a left to right or top to bottom. Like they go through yeah, this. That's what, yeah. It's a whirlwind. Yeah. So there's that. And then you and I have talked about sales and marketing. Don't invest over, don't overly invest in your, put some dollars behind marketing, right? and make that be a very cohesive effort selling into hotels. And then I think partnerships, what I'm hearing from hoteliers is that they want to partner with vendors who have really solid partnerships with other vendors. And I would say one of the best things I've done is become friends with sometimes my competitors, sometimes similar solutions, but having that network, like-minded salespeople where, where we're truly in it to solve problems and we're all road warriors, so we see each other at all these various events and uh, partnerships 
also will just shorten the sales cycle. If you can offer a suite of products that address problems, then it's less decision-making. I think hotels have decision fatigue. So those are some of them. I'm sure I'm leaving out some of my <laughs> opinions. <laughs> what I think also uh, looking at other B2B supplier and vendor yeah. websites that I visit, cause I love yeah. stocking people, more suppliers and vendors need to be on point right up front. What pain points that yeah. their product solves immediately and then simply pay that off to get someone's attention right away. So many hotel, some websites I go to, I'm left. I, I you really, don't even know. I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. You have to make the assumption that your audience isn't as well versed or as educated as you are. I hate to use the word dumb it down, but a fifth grade level to understand the challenge that some of these people are dealing with. If there's any question at all, right at the literally three seconds, if they don't know exactly what they're looking at, they're going to bounce. Yeah, it's true. And that brings up a really good point, which is reducing friction. So yes. reducing friction in your messaging. I work with a lot of, that's what I do a lot is don't get overly into the features and the functionality hmm. and the, the, no, I'm, I am providing a TV system that allows you to stream your own content easily with through Apple TV done. Right. But also eliminate friction in adopting the technology. So that is one of the biggest also recommendations. If the hotel, if they're going to ha have to shut down their operations and get trained on the solution for a whole week, and that has changed exponentially, right? 10 years ago, you really did have to send a trainer out for a lot of this stuff, get trained on how you use the solution. Like now it needs to be so easy to adopt throughout the hotel that because if you're going to add to the headaches that they're already having, mm -hmm. even if you, even if ultimately you're solving a problem, just going to take that much longer to implement. Totally. Because as we talked about even earlier, I hate to say it, a lot of people in the industry have a very short sighted mindset and they'll take on acute pain, much like even commissions, the way that the hotel, mm -hmm. they're okay with paying three times to acquire a guest at the back end instead of saving that up front. Right. You're absolutely right. If you if there's a barrier, that's a huge resistance barrier. If there's a learning curve yep. or a onboarding process going to be long and laborious even though it's going to save them tons of time and money in the back end. Yep. That again, it is about education, really believing in it. But also again, just understanding that this we're still in a phase of all these disparate technologies and so what can we all that's why i like the partner what can we do as vendors to make it easier for love the hotels that. love that hey this has been a great conversation I know. i'm gonna save some next for last i'm gonna actually gonna save one i've got justin on with for you i would die <laughs> <laughs> i would die <laughs> yeah that would be awesome you guys amazing and but i can't wait to have another conversation with you it's i really enjoy our combo mm -hmm. um so what are you up to these days and where can people find you before we leave? So I have a lot of great stuff going on. I think the demand for advising and consulting is really high right now. Everybody's afraid of the downturn. And so they Big don't time. want to pay really high diva salesperson yep. uh, salaries. Especially which... not your rate. They can right. So, so there's that. that. I, I, my website is hazevitality.com. You can reach me there. I'm also on, a lot of people know me from LinkedIn. I'm a little, maybe I overpost a smidge, but no. you can find me there. <laughs> I just love it. I'm a very social person. And so it's my answer to, and I've forged some amazing relationships based on LinkedIn. So you can find me there. Um, and yeah, if, if you're a tech company, either looking to break into North America or break into the hospitality industry, or you're already in the hospitality industry and you need to scale, um, I'm also part of GAIN, which is a, a hmm. growth advisor, advisors international network. So there's many of me looking to solve problems and, and we're happy to help. So lots of different places to find me. And, and I, it's really, this is such an exciting time. We're about to see so much innovation and, and the landscape is going to look very different when we talk again a year from now, although you and I will probably talk every week. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hope so. That'd be great. Fantastic. Yes. I love our combos. Thank you so much. And I look forward to having a, a follow-up conversation with you, Jess. Thank you for having me, Corey. Talk to you soon. You bet. Take care. Bye.